National Public Radio, in association with independent radio drama productions, presents one of the cases of Sherlock Holmes, with Edward Petherbridge as Sherlock Holmes and David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. This is episode two of A Scandal in Bohemia. Arthur Conan Doyle drew from real-life experiences whenever possible while creating the plots for the Sherlock Holmes stories. He spent six months in Vienna in 1891, and while there, soaked up all the human interest stories he could find. There was scandal in the air that cold winter, and the papers were filled with tragic tales of suicides and illicit affairs. The gossip pages of Viennese papers just sizzled with coverage of Ludmilla Hubel, a gifted singer and actress who had become involved with an heir to the Austrian throne. Compromising photographs showing her with the royal consort had been splashed all over the press. In real life, the singer and her lover were eventually married, but forced by the scandal to leave Viennese society. The couple bought a yacht and sailed to South America, never to be seen again. Conan Doyle's finish to this tale is substantially different, as we'll soon find out. Here's the story up to this point. Watson has married and begun his own medical practice. Chance leads him past 221B Baker Street, and he drops in on Holmes just in time to become involved in a case. A mysterious aristocrat comes calling. He is a large man who has chosen to hide his true identity behind a mask. But he has hardly begun to tell his story when Holmes correctly identifies him as the King of Bohemia, who has traveled all the way from Prague for this consultation. Five years earlier, the king made the acquaintance of a well-known adventuress named Irene Adler. Adler was an American, a singer, and an actress. But she was not of royal stature, and when the time came for the king to marry, he had to select from among his own kind and became engaged to the daughter of the king of Scandinavia. Then Irene Adler threatened to make public their relationship. Holmes asked the king what evidence Adler has to support her claim. There is writing, the king says. Forgery, replies Holmes. My private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. But there was also a photograph of the two together. That is very bad, Holmes tells the king. Your majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Five attempts have been made to steal the compromising photograph. All five have failed. In three days, the king's betrothal will be publicly announced at which time Irene Adler will release the photograph to the press. The king gives Holmes a blank check to obtain the picture for him. Holmes takes to disguise in order to scout Irene Adler's London house, Bryony Lodge. He asks Watson to return next evening for a progress report. Holmes has not yet returned when Watson arrives, so he waits. Soon Holmes appears. He has transformed himself into a drunken-looking groom ill-capped and side-whiskered with an inflamed face and disreputable clothes. Thus disguised, he mingled with the servants at Bryony Lodge to pick up gossip about Irene Adler. She is the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet, Holmes tells Watson. Continuing his story, Holmes explains how he was loitering just outside Bryony Lodge when a handsome cab rattled up to the front door. That's where we pick up the action in the second and concluding episode of A Scandal in Bohemia. Hey, Tim. Mr. Godfrey Norton, remarkably handsome, dark, aquiline, and moustached. It must be him. I wonder what he's up to. Evidently in a hurry. Ah. There he is in the sitting room. What's he doing now? Pacing up and down, waving his arms. Clearly in some agitation. Gone. Hmm, nope, the door's opening. Drive like the devil, Cabby. First to Gross and Hankey's in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in the Edgware Road. Now, half a guinea if you do it in 20 minutes. Ooh, right, I'll go. St. Monica's in the Edgware Road. What the devil can he got there? Ah, what's happening? It's Miss Hartley. What a vision. What a lovely woman. The Church of St. Monica and half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. Heavy! Heavy! Yes. Heavy! The Church of St. Monica and half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. Hey? Half a sovereign. Now, hurry up! Oh, for sovereign? You don't look as if you've got half a sixpence. Now, clear all. Here is the money. Now, drive! Oh, we'll rout you all, Saxon. Clean up there. Hup. Hup. So 
sorry, but we do need a witness. I can't carry on if we don't. Oh, for God's sake, man! Oh, ah, thank God! There, there is someone. I, I say, yes, you, you, you'll do. Come, come, come. 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 Yes, thank you. Ah, now, we may proceed. Will you, good sir, act as witness to the marriage of these two young people? Well, I don't know. Uh, there's a sovereign for your trouble. Now, we can proceed. Do you know of any reason whatsoever wherefore Mr. Godfrey Norton, bachelor, may not take Miss Irene Adler, spinster of this parish, to be his lawful wedded wife? You can't say as I do. Fascinating home. And what happened then? I got my sovereign. I intend to wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. Uh, yes, but what They were happened? married. And then they rushed out of the church and drove off in different directions. And I went off to make my own arrangements. Which are? Some cold beef and a glass of beer. I have been too busy to think of food and I am likely to be busier still this evening. I hope Mrs. Turner will have something on the go. By the way, Doctor, I shall want your cooperation. I shall be delighted. You don't mind breaking the law? Not in the least. Nor running the chance of arrest? Not in a good cause. Oh, the cause is excellent. Then I am your man. I was sure that I might rely on you. But what is it you wish me to do? Ah, Mrs. Turner, just be so good as to put the tray down there. What a spread, and a glass of the best brown ale. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Will you be wanting anything, Dr. Watson? Uh, uh, um, no, thank you, Mrs. Turner. I ate at one o'clock. Yes, regular hours. Mm, thank you, Mrs. Turner. And that will be all. I'll collect the tray later, Mr. Holmes. Now, Watson, we must discuss it while I eat, for I have not much time. It is nearly five now. In two hours, we must be on the scene of the action. Miss Irene, or Madame Nala, returns from her drive at seven. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I have already arranged what is to occur. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere. Come what may. You, you understand? I am to be neutral. Mm -hmm. To do nothing whatever. There will probably be some unpleasantness. Do not join it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that open window... Yes. You are to watch me, for I will be visible to you. Yes. And then, when I raise my hand, so, you will throw into the room what I give to you to throw. And um, will, at the same time, raise the cry of fire. Uh, you quite follow me? Entirely. Mm, it's nothing very formidable. Uh, here. It is an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at either end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to that... When you raise your cry of fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. You may then walk to the end of the street, and I will rejoin you in ten minutes. Mm, I hope I have uh, made myself clear. I am to remain neutral, to get near the window, to watch you, and at the signal to throw in this object, then to raise the cry of fire, and to await you at the corner of the street. Oh, precisely. Then you may entirely rely on me. That is excellent. I think perhaps uh, it is almost time to prepare the new role I have to play. Ah. Uh, Holmes, the stage lost a fine actor when you became a specialist in crime. Ah. Yeah. Are you all right, Holmes? Uh, uh, damn stiff collar. <laughs> Need a hand. Uh, 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 I'm drawn, my dear chap. Ah, oh, good grief. The Reverend Sherlock Holmes. My good fellow. We really must be getting along. <laughs> We have our duties to perform. We must not be tardy. It was a quarter past six when we left Baker Street, and it still wanted ten minutes to the hour when we found ourselves in Serpentine Avenue. It was already dusk, and the lamps were just being lighted. We paced up and down in front of Bryony Lodge, waiting for the coming of its occupant. 
The lamplight was thin and pallid and barely penetrated the growing pall of fog that billowed around Briony Lodge. The house was just as I had pictured it from Sherlock Holmes' succinct description. Less exclusive than Holmes led me to believe. You see, Watson. What, Holmes? Huh? The marriage rather simplifies the matter. The photograph becomes a double edged weapon now. The chances are that you will be as averse to its being seen by Mr. Godfrey Norton as our client is to its coming to the eyes of his princess. Now, the question is where are we to find the photograph? Where indeed? It is most unlikely that she carries it about her. It is in a wooden case, too large for easy concealment about a woman's dress. She knows that the king is capable of having her waylaid and searched. Two attempts of that sort have already been made. We may take it, then, that she does not carry it about with her. Where, then? Her banker or her lawyer. That is that double possibility. But I'm inclined to think neither. Women are naturally secretive, and they like to do their own secreting. Besides, remember that she had resolved to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands upon it. It must be in her own house. But it has twice been burgled. <laughs> They did not know how to look. But how will you look? I will not look. What then? I will get her to show me. But she will refuse. She will not be able to. But I hear the rumble of wheels. It is her carriage. Now, carry out my orders to the letter. such an angel. Look how she's ministering to Holmes. How can we do this? I'm ashamed. Holmes, I hope this is all for the good. I won't let you down. I cannot. Ah, this prank won't injure her, merely prevent her injuring another. I will do it. Now, where did I put the damn thing? Ah, here it is. I'll just take it out of my ulster. He raised his hand. And there, the maid is opening the window. Right. Fire! 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 Please, please, compose yourself. It is a false alarm. A false alarm. Oh, that's Holmes. Oh, what the devil's he up to? Now he's calming things down. Right, I must get out of here and wait for Holmes at the corner of the street. You did it very nicely, Doctor. Ah, oh, thank God, Holmes. Nothing could have been better. You have the photograph. I know where it is. And how did you find out? As she showed me, as I told you she would. 
I am still in the dark. <laughs> I do not wish to make a mystery. The matter was perfectly simple. You, of course, saw that everyone in the street was an accomplice. Uh, they were all engaged for the evening. Ah, yes, of course. I guessed as much. Uh, then, when the row broke out, I had a little moist red paint in the palm of my hand. I rushed forward, fell down, clapped my hand to my face, and became a piteous spectacle. It is an old trick. Yes, of course. Uh, then they carried me in. She was bound to have me in. What else could she do? And into her sitting room, which was the very room I suspected. They lay me on a couch. I motioned for air. They were compelled to open the window. And you had your chance. How did that help you? It was all important. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing which she values most. It is a perfectly overpowering impulse, and I have more than once taken advantage of it. In the case of the Darlington substitution scandal, it was of use to me, and also in the Arnsworth Castle business. A married woman grabs at her baby, and an unmarried one reaches for her jewel box. Now, it is clear to me that Our Lady of today had nothing in the house more precious to her than the photograph that compromises the King of Bohemia. She would rush to secure it. The alarm of the fire was admirably done. The smoke and the shouting were enough to shake nerves of steel. She responded beautifully. The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel just above the right bell pull. She was there in an instant, and I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I cried out that it was a false alarm, she replaced it, glanced at the rocket, rushed from the room, and I have not seen her since. I rose, and making my excuses, escaped from the house. I hesitated whether to secure the photograph at once, but the coachman had come in, and uh, as he was watching me narrowly, it seemed safer to wait. A little over precipitance may ruin all. And now? Our quest is practically finished. I shall call with the king tomorrow, and with you if you care to come with us. We will be shown into the sitting room to wait for the lady. And when will you call? At eight in the morning. She will not be up, so we shall have a clear field. Ah! Here we are. Uh, do you have a key, Watson? My dear Holmes, I no longer live here. Ah, <laughs> of course. Uh, I shall ring for Mrs. Turner. Uh, we have an early start. Will you uh, stay the night? Of course. Good. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Good night. Uh, who? Uh, I've heard that voice before. Now, I wonder who the deuce that could have been. Uh, no, thank you, Holmes. Just a drop more coffee. You have really got it. Uh, enough yet. But you have hopes. Mm, I have hopes. Then come. I am all impatience to be gone. Oh, um, and we must um, have a cab. My carriage is waiting. Mm. Well, uh, that will simplify matters. <laughs> Irene Adler is married. Married? When? Yesterday. But to who? To an English lawyer called Norton. But she could not love him. I am in hopes that she does. Why in hopes? Because it would spare your majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love your majesty. If she does not love your majesty, then there is no reason why she should interfere with your majesty's marriage to the princess. This is true. And yet, I wish she had been on my own station. What a queen she Ah, we have arrived. I say, Holmes, the door's open. And who's that old woman? Oh, I dare say we shall find out shortly. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. Uh, I am Holmes. Indeed. My mistress told me that you were likely to call. Uh, indeed? She left this morning with her husband by the 515 train from Charing Cross for the continent. What? Do you mean that she has left England? Never to return. And the photograph. Oh! All is lost. We shall see. Good Lord, what a mess. Books, drawers... Everything ransacked before they took flight. Holmes? Holmes, what are you doing? It is here, Watson. I saw it. This is where. Where? 
There is a photograph. But it is not the one that we are after. And a letter. It is addressed to me. My dear Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely. Until after the alarm fire, I had not a suspicion. But then, when I found how I had betrayed myself, I began to think. I had I been, been warned, warned against you months, months ago. ago. I, I had, had been, been told, told that if the king, king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. And your address had been given me. Yet with all this, you made me reveal what you wanted to know. Even after I became suspicious, I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind old clergyman. But you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. Male costume is nothing new to me. I often take advantage of the freedom which it gives. I sent John, the coachman, to watch you, ran upstairs, got into my walking clothes, as I call them, and came down just as you departed. Well, I followed you to your door, and so made sure that I was really an object of interest to the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then I rather imprudently wished you good night and started for the temple to see my husband. We both thought the best resource was flight when pursued by so formidable an antagonist, so you will find the nest empty when you call tomorrow. As to the photograph, your, your client, client may, may rest, rest in peace. peace. I love and am loved by a better man than he. The king may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged. I keep it only to safeguard myself and to preserve a weapon which will always secure me from any steps which he might take in the future. I leave a photograph which he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay, Adler. What a Oh, what a woman. Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Would she not have made an admirable queen? Is it not a pity she was not on my level? But from what I have seen in the lady, she seems indeed to be on a very different level to Your Majesty. I am sorry that I have not been able to bring Your Majesty's business to a more successful conclusion. On the contrary, my dear sir. Nothing could be more successful. I know that her word is in fire. The photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I am glad to hear Your Majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Pray tell me in what way I can reward you. This ring? Your Majesty has something which I should value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph. Irene's photograph. Sir, if you wish it. Then there is no more to be done in the matter. I have the honor to wish you a very good morning, Mr. Holmes. Holmes! Holmes, wait a moment. I can hardly keep up. No, my dear Watson, it is I who could not keep up. But I was left very far behind the game. That was how a great scandal threatened to affect the kingdom of Bohemia and how the best plans of Mr. Sherlock Holmes were beaten by a woman's wit. He used to make merry over the cleverness of women, but I have not heard him do it of late. And when he speaks of Irene Adler, or when he refers to her photograph, it is always under the honourable title of The Woman. Edward Petherbridge was Sherlock Holmes, with David Peart as Dr. John H. Watson. Kate Hamer was Irene Adler, Richard Shannon was Godfrey Norton, and John Elms was the King of Bohemia. The story was adapted for radio by Richard Shannon, with music performed by Robert Gibbs and Michiko Ueno. I'm Steve Zakar.
Support for this program is provided by National Public Radio member stations and the NPR Arts and Performance Fund. Contributors include the Chrysler Corporation Fund and the Bell Atlantic Charitable Foundation. Sherlock Holmes will be back in The Adventure of the Speckled Band. This is NPR National Public Radio. Counter tenor and ensemble director Drew Campion is the guest this week on Millennium of Music. He's got a new recording with his ensemble 5 1, and we'll hear some of it. Music of Campion, Morley, Holborn, Palestrina, and many more tonight on Millennium of Music. That's tonight at 8 o'clock here on 88.9 FM, WFSU FM, Tallahassee. <laughs> 